Five more minutes. Uh, let's let's put it this way. If you guys have questions about yesterday's problem, maybe Jonas can take one one question before we take for the last delay for today. Because you have questions. It's too early for questions. I will wait two more minutes. Okay, so let's get started. Um, we are in my third lecture, and today's topic. Ah, I need to put in the little sticker. Yeah, today's topic is gamma rays, and uh, you remember from our first lecture. Uh, the good side about gamma rays is they travel in straight lines, so we can do astronomy with it. They are easy to detect, meaning they produce readily air showers, and we can identify whether the air showers are from protons or from photons to some extent. Um, for the highest energies, we do have some absorption, so they can't travel from the end of the universe to us but uh, this is a minor problem, I'd say. And uh, it has turned out that gamma rays are the most productive messengers in astroparticle physics. In the last 20 years, we have almost everything we learned about cosmic rays and the origin of cosmic rays has been learned by gamma rays because you can identify the sources, because you can say this source a supernova remnant or a pulsar produces high energy particles. We can see it. And for cosmic rays, as I explained yesterday, uh, this is much more difficult. Okay. So uh, the question is now, how do you detect gamma ray sources in the sky? And there are two ways of doing that. The first is, uh, you know, cosmic rays come diffusely from everywhere. So wherever you look, you get the same number of cosmic rays. If now, for some reason, at one direction, from one direction in the sky, we have more events that correspond to this diffuse background, we can say, well, there must be a source. And it sends the, the particles directly to us, always from the same position. Okay? So we search for an excess from a certain point in the sky, above 
the diffuse background that is made by cosmic rays. And remember, even for strong gamma ray sources, the cosmic ray background is typically 1,000 times, 10,000 times more than the photons. So we need to do a good job in separating the background off. But, you know, this was how people initially thought they would detect gammas. They point a telescope in one direction and they see the telescope ticking. And then they point somewhere else and then it goes silent. It was not like that, of course. It's much too naive, but uh, this was one way of doing it. The second method, you have to be able to pick out the gamma rays from the cosmic ray background. So from the shower, or from what you measure, you can tell this is a gamma ray or this is a cosmic ray. Yeah? And this works quite nicely uh, for smaller energies where we can do it with satellites. We have a direct identification. I will explain you in a moment. And above 100 GeV or so, where we do air showers, is a bit more complicated, but we can identify the gamma uh, primaries from the shower shape, the muon content, uh, or to some extent also to a localized access of events uh, in, in a certain area. OK, so uh, here again, a schematic uh, view of the things. Uh, above is the, the top of the atmosphere. If the, gamma ray comes in, we can either measure it directly before it interacts in the atmosphere, or uh, we can let it interact in the atmosphere, make a shower, and then measure it with detectors, say, on mountain altitudes. If we have an experiment that is at 4,000 meters altitude, or 5,000, your colleagues here from Bolivia will know what I talk about, 5,000 meters altitude, the atmosphere is only half as thick as it is down here. Yeah? So you can easier measure these showers. You know, this shower here would be absorbed more or less in two and a half thousand meters altitude. But if you sit at 4,000 altitude, you can still see that. And, and here are examples. And, uh, and we see here again the shower size, so to say the particle numbers in some units as a function of altitude, we start with one particle and then the particle multiplication sets in. We reach a maximum and uh, then things die out. And if you want to measure shower particles at sea level, which is about 1,000 grams per square centimeters, then you measure only this tiny remnant of all the particles that have been absorbed. And here you see the names of two experiments that pursue this kind of intermediate height detection. Hawk in Mexico sits above 4,000 meters. Milagro in New Mexico in the United States was at two and a half kilometers in the past. Here is a satellite experiment measuring up here. And here you see schematically uh, some telescopes that look at the Cherenkov flight. This bluish cone here indicates the Cherenkov flight that is produced in, um, with all these charged particles in the atmosphere. Uh, that can make it down more or less to ground level. And that's why it's easy to, to identify these showers with that technique. But we will see that in, in a moment. Now, let me go back. This technique, and this technique is relatively old. It comes from cosmic ray research. You know, people have put detectors out there and they have captured the particles. Uh, also, this is, is old because early on, people already sent detectors up above the atmosphere with balloons or with rockets and so forth. Uh, but the real breakthrough in gamma ray astronomy at high energies uh, appeared through using this Cherenko flight from the ground. And I'll give you here now in the following some historic development uh, of gamma ray astronomy, which I think is quite interesting. <coughs> so in about 1910 or so, Yves Curie, this is the daughter of Madame Curie, the famous, uh, what was her name? 
Ne? Maria, thank you. Maria Curie. Uh, they, she worked like her parents with radioactive minerals and they kept it usually in water and uh, one could see at night the bluish light emerging from the water. This was what later on Jerenkov uh, has, has understood with experiments and characterized and why the, this radiation is called Jerenkov radiation. In 1912, Victor Hess discovered cosmic rays and Wilson invented a cloud chamber to make these particles visible. That was a great uh, milestone in the development of the field. Uh, Pierre Roger discovered air showers. I told you about that. And, uh, and then many discoveries followed in, in cosmic ray physics, discoveries in particle physics and so forth. And one, one learned a lot. In 1948, Enrico Fermi published the acceleration theory of cosmic rays, you know, and one understood that if you have high energy cosmic rays, you should have secondary gamma rays at high energies as well. And in the same year, uh, Blackett, a uh, Nobel Prize winner from the UK, recognized that this Cherenkov light, you know, from charged particles in the atmosphere, should contribute to the light seen in, in the night sky. And he estimated that the fast particles producing Cherenkov light make about 10 to the minus 4 of the total photon flux on Earth from stars, from air scintillation, and all that. And in principle, all that was enough to, do, uh, to, to understand that one should be able to do gamma ray astronomy with Cherenkov telescopes. Yeah? If the Cherenkov telescopes uh, can detect the Cherenkov light, and if gamma rays are produced by cosmic rays, uh, you should be able to find sources in the sky. So 1948, a number to memorize. Um, now, the first thing, of course, was to look with air shower arrays and try to see whether there is an axis in the sky. But this was all unsuccessful. You know, the, the variation in the cosmic ray flux or so did not allow to see a tiny little fraction of photons in the sky. Now, this unsuccessful was, of course, for some experiments, other experiments claimed they had seen sources. No? And unfortunately, then a hype came about. People thought, well, if they can see it, we can see it as well. And they published stuff that were basically not statistically uh, significant and could not be substantiated. And after a while, you know, it was seen that these claims were all fake. So here are a few of the experimental highlights. So detect Cherenkov flight from showers. Yeah? In 48, this was more or less clear it should happen. In 53, Galbraith and Jelly in the UK used such trash cans with a searchlight mirror here and one photomultiplier in the focal point of the mirror. And the idea was then they collect the light and they see pulses. And here you see the pulse height yeah, and as a, the function of the number of signals they could see in, uh, in these uh, events. And you see there's a, a lowish end where you know the, it's too much, they can't see it. But then here, dominant part at low, low uh, pulse heights. But then there is this long tail to high pulse heights. And they identified that this here cannot be just the normal noise and the variation of it, but this must be the Cherenkov flight where really high pulses are produced. And they used these photomultipliers that were suitable to see nanosecond pulses, which usually you don't get from air scintillation. You know, air scintillation is something that, that is on a longer time scale. So they saw these big pulses at the short time scales. And so that was the first detection of Cherenkov flight from showers. Now, these were cosmic ray showers. You know, They didn't have any suppression of cosmic ray. So clearly, they just proven that Blackett's assumption was right, that 
uh, Cherenkov flight from showers could be detected. Then in 58, the, in 59, there were seminal papers by Morrison and Cocconi, and uh, the latter one especially suggested to observe the Crab Nebula. You remember the Crab Nebula was this supernova explosion that happened in 1054, still ongoing, still being an exciting source in any wavelength you observe it. Yeah? And here it says an air shower telescope and the detection of 10 to the 12 electron volt photon sources. Yeah? So uh, he wanted to detect 10 to the 12 electron photons. But even that was an assumption. Crab was a powerful source, yes. But whether it could make 10 to the 12, nobody ever has seen photons from higher than maybe KeV or so at that time. Yeah? 10 to the 12 is a, a million times more than, than you know, X-rays or so. In this paper, we discuss the possibility of detecting high energy photons produced by discrete astronomical objects. Yeah? So it's just a discussion paper. He mentions the Crab Nebula. He says the energy, therefore, could possibly be 10 to the 12 electron volts. And he estimated a flux, you know, how many of those photons you could possibly be seeing. And now this flux here, 10 to the minus 3.8 per square million second, is hopelessly optimistic. Yeah? But since it was written here and people read that, they said, wow, if it's that flux, we should be able to see it. And they started, this paper started the boost to, uh, for experimentalists to try and detect these. So at that time, still there was equipment ready from, uh, readily available from the war, searchlight mirrors, you know, kind of movable uh, devices where you could position cannons or searchlights and move them around so you could point at things. So what they did, they put these mirrors here on these devices and they had light detectors in the focal point. And um, Satsepin, that's the guy that developed the Grice and Satsepin Kuzmin cutoff, he asked Chutakov, the experimentalist, to measure uh, the predicted gamma ray sources. And he built 12 telescopes. You know, it's always better to have more than one because one can always see some flaky signals. But if you see them in different telescopes, uh, you're more sure. And then these things are sitting on rails so you could modify the distance between them. And they did these experiments at the Crimean Sea uh, for several years here, uh, but they didn't see any results. And it dawned on them that Coconi's estimate was too optimistic. So uh, whether he was, you know, just naive or did a, made a mistake, I don't know. But sometimes theorists have to be too optimistic. Otherwise, experimentalists would be discouraged. Yeah? So, but, you know, this triggered the activity. Now, uh, it became clear then if you photograph such a cascade in the atmosphere, it might help if you do that with different telescopes at the same time, and you get a stereo view. And this is a paper by Zatzepin, where he describes the distribution of, of Cherenkov flight in a camera. So you see here the typical shapes of these showers, a denser core and a longer tail, but a bit elliptic like that. And he also uh, discussed here that you know you could do stereo imaging and like that you could improve the reconstruction. Yeah? Uh, could seek improved accuracy uh, in the determination of photographing the shower simultaneously from several positions. Again, this was just a, a theoretical work and it took a while before it, it was uh, put into action. Porter and Shelley continued 62 to 66 with such a double telescope. Yeah. This is not yet stereo, because for stereo you have to put the telescopes apart by a few hundred meters so that you really can triangulate. This is just to, uh, to you know, get not fooled by signals in one, in one detector. 
And then from that work, by the way, these were Irish guys, you know, and uh, the Irish emigrated to the United States for various reasons, uh, but they kept contact. So what they were doing was well known to Trevor Weeks, another Irish guy who worked at the Mount Hopkins Observatory in Arizona. And he tried the same thing. You recognize by now the searchlight mirror, the detector, and also here in, in good conditions, you know, in a desert on a mountain with clear skies, they couldn't see uh, much with, with that. But then they got more ambitious, and in 1968, uh, they wrote about a search for discrete sources at 2 times 10 to the 12 electron volts, and here is Trevor Weeks. And, uh, you know, they had upper limits, and they, they understood they have to do much better. And they did. In 1968, they built this telescope, 10 meters diameter, with mirror facets, and here is the camera, uh, the 10-meter Whipple telescope. And here, for the first time, the camera contains 50 pixels, yeah? It's not just one pixel that gives that response with a high rate, but it's 50 pixels where you can resolve this shape, the image of the Jarenkov shower in the atmosphere. And then came Michael Hillas from the University of Leeds. He was a deep thinker, and uh, you know he he was worrying about the three to four sigma level discoveries that later on turned out to be wrong. And he said once, a physicist's apparatus gradually learns what is expected of it. It has a dog-like desire to please its master. So he understood that you need to have a decent image analysis attached to it if you want to separate protons from, from photons. And uh, here, the, the colored background here roughly shows a shower, and he parametrized that, the image of a shower, parametrized that with an ellipse, and he had various quantities in that ellipse, so the length, the width, uh, the distance from where this ellipse happened uh, to the point where the telescope was pointing at in the sky, and so forth, and he used these parameters to characterize the images and separate photon-like from hadron-like. And you won't believe it, these parameters still are used today uh, because in, in the end they were very successful. So then in 1989, the crab was finally discovered. So we are talking here, you know, another 20 years of work before that finally succeeded and we are talking 20, 40 years, no, 89, 20 years from the telescope being built to the first gamma ray source detected. Nowadays, it would almost be impossible. If you get money to build something and you don't come up with results within five years, you are in deep problems. Yeah? But they had the time, of course, the day job was not to work with that. They did some other astrophysics stuff, and in their spare time, they worked with that telescope. But at least they were ambitious enough to try for 20 years, you know, to get it work. And so it was a great success when in 1989, the observations together with the Hillas image analysis gave a very high significance that they have detected the crab. And by that time, the camera was extended, you know, from the initial 50 pixels. They had now 160 pixels. Now, we are all spoiled, you know. In our telephones, we have 6 million pixels. And you see a, a picture in great detail. If you have only 50 pixels, you know, such a shower looks just like a blob. Yeah? It's very difficult to draw something out of it. So then... Sources were seen everywhere. You know, that was a great success. And all the people who had made experiments, said, oh, yeah, we see sources too. And there is one paper, I don't give the title and the authors, they claimed then very shortly after that they have seen Vela X1, Sen X3, you know, X-ray source in Centaurus, X-ray source in the Vela constellation, AE Aquarius, 
and so forth. You know, in one paper they claimed three new sources. Now, of course, it was all wrong. You know, not a single one uh, stayed after after checks were done. And because of this hype with wrong results, one then introduced that at least five sigma significance has to be reached before you publish this. And then an independent instrument has to see the same source also significantly before one believed it. Then the HECRA experiment on La Palma came. This was largely a European thing, you know, German institutions here, but also very significantly a group from Yerevan. They had worked in, in uh, Yerevan on the mountain and were planning to build a five telescope system there. And after the first telescope was built, Soviet Union collapsed, there was no money for anything anymore. And they were lucky enough to just move over to the institutes in Germany, in Munich and in Heidelberg and build their telescopes here with German money on, on La Palma. And you see here, every symbol is a detector. The little squares are just particle detectors in, uh, in, a, in an array. The, the rectangles here are muon detectors, you know, somewhat larger devices with absorbers and so forth, and, and so forth. And they put five telescopes on here. So they went for the stereo techniques and they wanted to make imaging uh, Cherenkov measurements. Imaging because they, they record an image of the shower in Cherenkov light. They looked like that. It's maybe three or four meters diameter. Here's the camera, then already with a few hundred pixels. And uh, it was relatively quickly that they were successful. Yeah? In 1992, they could uh, detect a crab nebula. That was, of course, no discovery, but they saw it at the same flux and so forth. And then they started to do stereo observations when all five telescopes were deployed. And uh, they could prove that stereo helps a lot in reconstruction. Yeah? So first successful stereo reconstruction were done with, with these telescopes. Here you see them in the field. It's a sloping hill. There's all sorts of stuff in between. But here is a telescope. Here is one. Here is one. Here is one. And somewhere over there. Oh, well, one is missing on the picture. So it was a success, but it was clear that the sensitivity of these telescopes were not terribly high. And so some of the people decided to build a system of four telescopes that are much larger. These are now 12-meter telescopes, and they have been built in Namibia on the southern hemisphere. The idea was large telescopes, a system of that for stereo vision going to the southern hemisphere because there you look at the galactic center. There are lots of sources close to us which likely will produce gamma rays. And, you know, these telescopes are not terribly elegant. They are driving on rails, you know, they are steel, they move around slowly, but they were easy to build. And so two groups started to work on that. Yeah? The group from a Max Planck Institute in Munich and another group with the Max, from the Max Planck Institute in Heidelberg. And these were the Heidelberg guys that took them off and said, we built this in Namibia as quickly as possible. And they had cameras with big field of views. So you could see a lot of sources. You could see these showers very well. And they could start taking data already in 2004. The cameras by now had 1,000 pixels. And, uh, and the other ones, the other area, uh, group of people wanted to build better telescopes on La Palma. Uh, but I come to that in, in a moment. So that was a major step forward. And so this is the second part now of the timeline. So the ingredients were ready in 1948. Ripple was built 1968. 20 years later, uh, the first one was discovered. Now here, these have been then discovered subsequently. 1992, Makarian 421. Three years later, yeah, 
They were observing every minute they could observe, every dark night, you know, month after month. And they looked at objects where theoreticians said, well, this might be a promising gamma ray candidate. But uh, they were not successful. Only three years later, Makarian 4101 with a Whipple telescope. Then Makarian 501, another four years later with Whipple. Then a source seen by the Crimean telescope, another source by Whipple, another source on the southern hemisphere. This was a telescope the Durham University from the UK has set up in Australia and so forth. And you see here the type of sources. The Pulsar Wind Nebula, this is a supernova explosion. All these HBL, BL stands for blazars, are active galaxies. Active galaxies tend to shoot out massive jets from their poles. And if these jets points, point towards Earth, then we can see this high energy photon emission. It's like looking for us, like looking down the barrel of a gun. Yeah? The jet comes right at us and is coming at us with a good fraction of the speed of light kind of enhances the photon flux. So these were seen relatively often, but you know we are now here 10 years later. So seven sources in 10 years is not exactly a lot. Yeah? And then another few years with Hekra, with Whipple, Hekra, Hekra, Kangaroo, a Japanese experiment, produced in the next five years another handful of sources. This is just not enough to do much with it. And then Hess started. And in the first year, Hess discovered 16 new sources. Yeah? The reason was that it was so much more sensitive, was so much more better in collecting these events and telling apart, this is a photon, this is a cosmic ray, that they really made a game changer. Now let's count here, 2, 4, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10, 11, 12, 13, 14, okay? In one year, they doubled the number of sources. In the next year, again, new sources and so forth. And that was then when gamma ray astronomy with this technique really started. Yeah? So now I said before, one learned about cosmic rays and the relation is this. Yeah, with these telescopes, they measured photons coming, being produced close to the sources. But the sources, of course, needed to accelerate cosmic rays first. And one learned about spectra, about the processes that, that can accelerate particles and all that. And, uh, and a lot of progress was achieved. Now, let's look at the gamma ray production close to these sources. And I mentioned here the two ways of doing that, by either hadronically producing pions, whereas the pi zeros decay, or secondly, by having relativistic electrons, which are bent in magnetic fields and then give off synchrotron radiation. And this is what we see here. So if we have a relativistic electron of some high energies, this is a characteristic spectrum we would get uh, being emitted by synchrotron emission. Yeah? So we need, of course, a magnetic field somewhere, and then the relativistic electron gives off some of its energy. And you see this is a huge range of energies. Yeah? So say if we have GeV or 100 GeV electrons, they can make such a spectrum. Very characteristic shape. But you see now also it goes from radio to infrared, visible light, X-rays. Uh, so it helps to measure that shape in astronomy of very different wavelengths. And once you see that, well, you know, there is a cosmic electron accelerator at work. You can't say from that there are also hadrons, protons accelerated, but, uh, you know, it's relatively likely. And now here is a second such shape. Now, what the hell could that be? The point is that if you have a relativistic electron, as it makes this photon, these photons here can be, uh, can be scattered on and the relativistic electron imparts a lot of energy on this photon and makes a low energy photon a high energy photon. This is kind of an inverse of the Compton effect we use to detect photons 
and it just boosts this distribution up to even higher energies. Yeah? So if we have only relativistic electrons that make photons, we get very often this characteristic bump. And here we are now already in the TeV range. Yeah? So of course, then we need electrons that have TeV. If the electrons have only GeV, then this can't, can't happen. But if the energy of the electrons is high enough, then we get this double structure in photons. And now the third reaction comes in. If indeed protons were to, to interact with gas and dust and produce pi zeros, then we would get such a broad peak from the pi zero decay. And this broad peak, the center of that, would basically tell us about the energy of the primary protons. So if we have a combination of these, these mechanisms that produce the gamma rays, maybe we can learn you know, whether it was a predominantly proton accelerator or predominantly electron accelerator, uh, which we were observing. Good. So let's look at some of the experiments that have been done. I've showed you that already. So we go now from satellite to mountain range to ground-based. Uh, this is a mountain range experiment in Tibet. And you see here a huge hall. This is 200 meters or so. Yeah? And here, this is inside all. It looks a little bit like a railway station just out there. Yeah? And you see here detectors on the ground covering the floor of this huge hall. And uh, there are wires in these detectors so and strips perpendicular to it. So when a particle goes through, you see a signal on one strip and on one wire, and you can reconstruct where the particle went through. And here you see such a shower coming through. And you see here the individual cells that have fired. And you see here the shower center where many have fired. And so like that, the idea was you can, you can measure this, uh, this shower front coming in. Yeah? And again, if they come in inclined, uh, the ones that hit the detectors earlier will give earlier signal. The ones that hit the detector later will make later signal so you can reconstruct the the shower direction. And then from this shape, from this image here, the, the scatter of, of detector cells hit, one thought one could identify whether it was a proton or not. The experiment was called Argo. It was a Chinese-Italian uh, collaboration. The Chinese had the site and built it the hall, uh, and the Italians had these resistive plate chambers uh, and, and delivered that. So here is the hall we've just talked about now. Now, outside, the Chinese built also a big array of individual detectors. This is a Tibet AS gamma experiment. This is on a plateau 4,200 meters above sea level in Tibet. And uh, so kind of we are sitting right in the middle of showers. And the idea was it's a good, good point to separate these things. Uh, this is Milagro in New Mexico. They had here a big pond of water. This is 80 by 60 meters and eight meter deep. And they covered that with a, a opaque plastic so that no light comes in. And here you see inside this, this is a plastic cover. Here's a water pond. And in the clear water, they have submerged photo detectors. So it is kind of a, a similar array of light detectors but here it is now the particles that go through the water and create Cherenkov light in the water. And at some stage then they covered up uh, the pond halfway through the eight meters. So they had a lower section where only muons predominantly made signals and the upper section were predominantly uh, electromagnetic particles made signals. And this event, this experiment and these events, uh, experiments here, had a big advantage that they were looking at the sky from above. Every shower that hit their detector could be reconstructed, you know. The next one came from there, they reconstructed it too. So they could observe the full sky above the experiment uh, also during day uh, because, you know, the light didn't, didn't harm them. 
And they were looking for excesses in the sky. Yeah? Initially, they wanted to, to separate photons from hadrons by looking at their event structure, but that didn't work very well. So in the end, they just looked for excesses in the sky. So they had a poor gamma hadron separation, and uh, they used the excess count. Now, there are sources which you can use to calibrate, namely the sun, the moon. They cast a shadow. Yeah? The Earth, Earth sits here. Cosmic rays come from the galaxy. If the moon sits somewhere in the way, the cosmic rays are stopped in the moon, and we would see a deficit from the direction of the moon or from the direction of the sun. And uh, that they have successfully uh, shown. I show a picture in a moment. And they detected also credibly the Crab Nebula. The Crab Nebula is the strongest source we had seen at that time. It was measured by many experiments, so it was a standard candle. Always, if you do an experiment in gamma ray astronomy, you first have to show that you can see the Crab. Yeah? And, and then after a few years, they saw also a few other of the stronger sources. So here is the moon shadow, OK? Again, here, the example, the cosmic rays stream in. The ones that hit the moon are absorbed. So you have a deficit in here. And then they did with TPIT, AS gamma, and with Argo. And uh, you see here, the deficit is shown as a blue contour. The circle, the dashed circle, is where the moon is sitting. And also here, the center of the moon. And you see there is a systematic di displacement. Well. That's interesting, you can see that. You would expect it because these cosmic rays fly through the magnetic field of the Earth. And there is a little bit of deflection. It's energy dependent. The higher the energy, the smaller the deflection. And they could see that. Yeah? So they see the moon shadow. They see this deflection that is the right size of what you would expect. So they are confident that their experiments are working, working well. Then they produced these sky maps. Yeah? So the crab was seen. The dark blue here is uh, well. The color code somehow is weird. You know, they have seen the crab. They have seen Markarian 421, and they have seen the Cygnus region, which is an area where many sources are sitting, uh, where one doesn't really know what's going on. But, uh, but there is an enhanced gamma ray emission as well. And then they see these enhancements or deficits, you know. So something is going on. You can't identify that with a single source because for that it's too big. But maybe this is looking into the spiral arm, something. Though it was intriguing. They saw a few sources. Uh, same for Milagro. Yeah? They had some areas, region B, region A, where they saw a little bit more and they had ideas what it could be. Uh, but altogether, they stayed with a handful of sources they could detect. Now, with time, when time went on, they in the end could identify the crab and a few others which remained unnamed initially, and then here a few more that could be identified with previously measured egret sources. Yeah? So these little squares are sources that have been seen by a satellite experiment, and they saw then here some sort of coincidence, and they started to identify objects. So again, these experiments are great because they observe the full sky 24 hours a day. Yeah? But they are not very sensitive. That means you need a relatively strong source that you see something at all. And you are far from being doing detailed physics with, with the photons, a few photons that come from, from this thing here, especially because you don't have a list of 100 photons from that source. You do have 110 photons from that source. And this is about 100 background and about 10 are real photons, but you don't know which is which. Yeah? So it's a complicated situation if you want to analyze that and you have a lot of background. 
Now Fermi came along, the Fermi satellite, and Fermi published source catalogs, yeah? the little white things here. And, uh, and then Milagro dared to publish their contours, which are here, you know, color-wise, four sigma to six sigma or something like that, or here three sigma, four sigma. Alone, you would not have believed that. But if Fermi says, well, we see here in this position two sources that make GeV gamma rays, then this becomes perhaps a little bit more credible. Hawk came after Milagro. It's an experiment in Mexico, also on above 4,000 meters, and they have many of those big tanks of water, then four detectors of light in the tanks, and if a particle goes through, makes Jarenkov light, this can be detected. So here you see the layout. Meanwhile, the installation is finished, and not only this core area is working, but also around some smaller detectors help to reconstruct the events. And an event looks then like this, you know, a shower hits here, you see high signals close to the shower core, you see lower signals further out, and from that footprint and the, the variations in that, you know, one detector hit here, one detector hit there, two detectors here, you may be able to identify what, what the thing is. Ground-based now. So here again, the shower. The shower produces Jarenkov light. The Jarenkov pool at Earth that comes from one shower has about a diameter of 250 meters. Yeah? So it's really like shining with a torch towards the wall. What you enlighten is a roundish area and in this case, it's of the order of 250 meters across. And if you have your telescope standing in this light pool, it can image the shower and make, make an image here in the camera. Yeah. Another way of doing it, so this, this in color is the Cherenkov density over an area from a kilometer by a kilometer. Yeah. And this is the density. So you see this this relatively bright part in the center that is really this here. Of course, it's not a sharp edge, but you see a bright part in the center, and then very rapidly the density falls off further out. And if we were to put here some, some detectors that just record a Cherenkov flight, we could measure this lateral distribution of Cherenkov flight. So this core distance number of Cherenkov photons uh, it's more or less constant in this area here, and then rapidly it falls off. So this is a detector technique that has been used, but the imaging turned out to be the most uh, successful one. Cherenkov light is good because it is made by the many, many secondary particles in the shower. So in a sense, the number of Cherenkov photons you see is proportional to the primary energy. It's a calorimetric measurement, and you don't need much modeling and so forth to conclude from the Cherenkov light scene to what the primary energy was. OK, so uh, just a little step back. So such type detectors were displayed as well in HECRA. And you they were very simple. You just open up. You have here scintillation counters. And uh, you see that with one, one photomultiplier. This is one of the boxes. But the other ones were just open on the top. And you had a shutter that were opened in the evening, and you collected the drink of light that was falling in. This was called aerobic. And these are the smaller of the boxes you can see here in the middle. OK, Hawk again. This is a very big event. You see the color code at the arrival time, so it's a shower that comes in from one side. And you see here now also these outer detectors that help to constrain the geometry of the event. Satellite experiments. A famous one was the Compton Gamma Ray Observatory. This is the size of a bus, really huge. I think it was one of the largest payloads ever launched into an orbit. And it had different instruments. Uh, OSI and BATSI were little detectors on the edges. Uh, then there was COMTEL using 
the Compton effect to, to measure MeV, fraction of an MeV, gamma rays, and then it was egret. Egret used the pair production. Photon makes a pair to, to measure high energy. Photons, you see, its energy range was 20 MeV to 30 GeV. Batsi was 20 to 600 KeV. And Ossi was up to 10 MeV, and Comtel was 1 to 30 MeV. So different instruments on this for different energy ranges. It flew in the 1990s, and it discovered 271 gamma ray sources that emitted above 100 G, uh, MeV. So that was basically all done with the egret. At the lower energies, it also saw aluminum-26, a radioactive isotope that is produced copiously when you have supernova explosions or star explosions. And it also discovered about 2,000 gamma ray bursts. That was great. That was a milestone. So many sources, you know, which you could study. Uh, that, that was really a great advance to the, the situation before. Now you are aware of the Fermi satellite. It was launched in 2008. Very much the same thing. You know, you have a detector for high energy particles using pair production. Now the detector is silicon strips. Before at the Compton ray, it was lead plates or tungsten plates with gas chambers in between. And also there are, you know, gamma ray burst monitors and things like that. It is big compared to the other one, and uh, we are meanwhile at above 5,000 sources and above 5,000 gamma ray bursts. Here is a cut through. You see the detectors. The photon comes in. It converts into a pair. The pair is tracked, and in the end, the energy is measured in a calorimeter. And there is this de detector around. You see these detectors here going all around the main detector in the center. This is a veto, an anti-coincidence detector. So if a charged particle comes in here, it would make a signal there. It would do ionization, and we would see a signal in that detector. So whenever an event happens where there is a signal in here, in these outer detectors, we know it was a cosmic ray, for certain. Yeah? There's no way a cosmic ray can get into that detector without leaving a trace in these anti-coincidence shields around. And that makes this, gives that a perfect rejection of charged primaries and only the small set of events where there is nothing seen here. You know, the photon doesn't leave a trace until it creates a pair. So a pair is created out of nothing, and then we know that was a photon. And of course, there were lots of interesting things that could be seen with these sources. Supernova remnants, uh, gamma ray bursts, pulsar wind nebula like the crab, uh, active galactic nuclei with the jets pointing at us, or also those which didn't point at us, were just weaker. Because there are so many sources being seen, this is a sky map here of the Fermi sky, uh, you could make catalogs of objects. Yeah. So this is a typical projection where the full sphere uh, is projected on a two-dimensional area. And uh, you see prominently the galactic disk. Here is the galactic center. Here is the anti-center. We're sitting in the disk. So the center is one direction. Out of the galaxy goes that way. You know, And as long as we look out of the disk, uh, there is much less. There are sources here also, but not as much as as in here. And with such an instrument that is so much more sensitive than its predecessor, you detect things that nobody has expected. So all of a sudden here, somebody saw, this is artificial now, saw emission from a blob above and below the galactic center, you know, in gamma rays. And interestingly, I have to go a step back. You know that Fermi makes this data public. So you can download the data, you can analyze it without being a member of the collaboration. You get the software that helps you with that. This is great. So these bubbles, 
were published by somebody who wasn't even in, in the Fermi collaboration. Somebody looked at that and said, hey, look, if I make these and these cuts, there is gamma ray uh, emission in a certain energy range that looks like bubbles. What the hell is this? Yeah. And then the Fermi people went back and analyzed and confirmed that. And up to today, one doesn't really know where this comes from. It looks as if our galactic center was active for a few thousand years. Maybe it swallowed a star. In our galactic center, there sits a two million mass, solar mass black hole. Maybe it swallowed a star and got some, some excitement going on for a few hundred years, and this is still a remnant of what we see. So if you have good data, there is lots and lots to discover that nobody ever had thought before. And you learn by you know, seeing things that nobody has seen before. OK, uh, but, sorry, I'm going backward. The downside of these satellite experiments are that they do have an upper limit. You know, They are relatively small. And Fermi could identify a shower of 300 GeV and determine its energy, roughly. But it rarely ever happens, because it's so small. And the flux of these guys is so, so small that they don't see, in the many years of operation now, terribly many events of that energy. And that is where we have to go now with the Cherenkov telescopes. Yeah? The energy range is here 100 GeV. This is almost the limit of Fermi. Yeah? We need a big energy so that many particles are created. A lot of Cherenkov light has been produced so that we can, can analyze that. But the technique goes up to 300 TeV or below. You know, this is a factor of 1,000 higher in energy. And this is exciting stuff that, that we can do there. The downside with these telescopes, you have to point it somewhere. You can only see a source sitting here if you point the telescope in this direction. Fermi goes around the Earth, and every one and a half hours, it sees the full sky. Yeah? Um, but here we have to stare. We have to know where to look at. And this is the, the, the strong side, then. It's so much more sensitive to the, to the high energies. So, here is a gamma ray shower in a simulation. Here's a proton shower. The images don't look like that. You know, Think of a telescope standing here, and only the Cherenkov photons that fall on that Cherenkov uh, telescope make the image. Yeah? And then we have to distinguish those two. So shower shape, axis of events, You know, we have to find a way to identify things. And I'll explain that again to you. So here is the Cherenkov distribution. We have this dense center and then the fall off. This is for an electromagnetic shower. Electromagnetic showers nicely develop. One electron makes an electron and a photon. One photon makes a pair. It's always a factor of two. Yeah? And there's not much, not much uh, fluctuation in it. So we get such an image. Look at the color backside here. If we look at a proton shower, it looks more like that on the ground. What is these things here? There are subshowers. There are muons that are penetrating. They produce rank of light on the way. And so that we have these circles that are slightly, or here, slightly moving a little bit. You know, small circles here, and then bigger circles a little bit offset. This is the primary particle that that makes Cherenkov flight, or the, the muons that are copiously uh, produced in proton and iron showers that are then multiple scattered, and they show up like that. So the picture is, can be very different, and it's difficult to, to tell them apart, since you do see only a small part of the, uh, of the shower. So for instance, if your telescope stands here by chance, you see a lot of this guy here. If it stands there, it gets a totally different image. And, sorry. OK, so with several telescopes, it's stereo. That's good. Uh, no. This is what I wanted to show. But the, the great thing is, with a satellite experiment, we have one square meter. Here, the size of that light pool 
is effectively the area of the Cherenkov detector. So if you have one telescope standing here, it can see a photon that comes in there because its light pool still reaches the telescope. If a photon comes in here, it's still the light pool reaches the telescope, it can be detected. So effectively here, we have a detector size of 10 to the 5 square meters, from 1 to 10 to the 5. So we can observe energies that are 100,000 times rarer than, than with satellite detectors. Okay, now here I show you images. It's a random set. Yeah? This is a camera. And we look for nicely elongated shapes. This was maybe a photon. The rings are muons. And the fuzzy ones are, uh, are probably hadronic showers. So let's see, proton, muon ring, maybe a photon, muon ring, maybe a photon, maybe a photon, muon ring, a proton, a proton, a muon ring. Yeah? So you have 10,000 times more protons than photons, and some are easy to reject that they are not photons, but some, it's a bit complicated. Also, if you see not a complete ring, you know, but only a part of it, it may well look like a gamma ray shower. And this is what our electronics is doing. Yeah? We are seeing kilohertz of those events in the telescopes. And then a fast software has to, to find out which are possibly um, the gamma ray ones. And again, uh, the parametrization of these images are used uh, to, to look whether they are gamma ray-like or not. So I show here the Hess experiment. This is now a later photo. In 2012, they added a fifth telescope, 28 meters diameter, a huge mirror. This is a truck here. Yeah, this little thing is a truck. Yeah. It's a huge mirror. And... Um, so this collects a lot of Cherenkov lights, and even showers of a low energy uh, can be detected with that. Meanwhile, further experiments have been built. Veritas. This is at the site in Arizona where the original Whipple telescope was, was placed. Now four telescopes of 12 meters. This is Hess in Namibia on the southern hemisphere. And this is, are the magic telescopes on La Palma. So this other group that worked on La Palma wanted to do their, uh, their next generation telescopes in the same place. These are 17 meter telescopes. And these are technological wonders, so to say. They are huge. They are built of carbon fiber. They are very lightweight. They can be swung around to every point in the sky within 20 seconds. Yeah? The idea was they want to see low energy showers that come from gamma ray bursts. The gamma ray bursts go off and you have to move your telescope there very quickly. Really high tech in every aspect. You see the two and a half ton camera dangles here on an arc that is 20 meters high and it's, it's fixed with ropes to the side and so forth. The point was they started at about the same time as Hess. But because their design was so ambitious, they started taking data only seven years after Hess has started with his 15 new sources per year. So these three experiments together have detected about 200 gamma ray sources in the range above a few hundred TEV, GeV. And uh, I'll tell you then in the next lecture a little bit about the results we have seen. Oh, maybe I can show you a few more pictures since we, sorry, since we have time. Okay, so the CRAB was one of the first uh, Fermi satellite. I've said that. So this is now a Fermi sky map. You see here the galactic disk. You see here individual sources, the CRAB nebula, Geminga, Vela. They sit in the galaxy galactic plane, yeah? but you see here also diffuse emission. And if you have in the galaxy a lot of cosmic rays, charged cosmic rays, they go through molecular clouds, they go through gas to dust, and they interact and produce photons via pion decay. So there are diffuse areas too. 
But here you see also sources that sit far away from the galactic plane. They are extragalactic sources. Yeah? PKS, PSR, pulsar uh, wind, this is a pulsar here. This is an active galaxy and so forth. And these guys are partially at huge distances. You know, our galaxy is close, 100,000 light years, nothing. Yeah? But some of these extragalactic sources are sit at a redshift of 1.7 or something like that, where with really cosmological distances, and still they provide at Earth so many gamma rays of TeV energies, uh, of GV energies that we can, can see them comfortably. There's another guy, unidentified. What the hell is this? Yeah? Gives us a lot of gamma rays, so there must be a powerful engine, yet it is not seen in any other wavelength. There's no optical, there's no X-ray, there's no radio, but in gamma rays it gives us more energy than, than a typical output of a galaxy like our own. So there are really weird objects there. And uh, this is a somewhat old map, you know, with every year uh, Fermi publishes new, new sources. Here you see with more resolution the two-year catalog from 100 MeV to 100 GeV, and you see lots of details here. And the longer you, you look, the more you see. And here you kind of see some indication of diffuse emission above the galactic disk. So with somewhat other cuts, you could see here rather prominently uh, gamma ray lit large structures that cover you know, half the sky. Yeah. So the more you look, the more details you find. And all that is at your fingertips. Download it, make such a map, print it five by five meters for your bedroom, and you have a great sky that stimulates you every morning to get up and do work in astroparticle physics. These are gamma ray bursts as seen by Fermi. Yeah? They are diffuse. There is no indication that the galactic disk would stand out. So this is ample proof that gamma ray bursts are not a galactic phenomenon. Yeah? They come from everywhere. They are uniformly distributed. So they are at, at cosmological distances and must be very, very powerful because cosmological distances means far away and still we see their outbursts here at Earth. Here again, Fermi uh, maps now with a decent cut so that you see the bubbles. Uh, uh, you see here X-ray emission, this bluish thing, uh, and it's 50,000 light years across. Yeah. So what that was, people are still, still wondering. It came totally unexpected and was discovered by not the Fermi people. Now you can look at the spectra. Yeah. You can look what the, the brightness is as a function of the distance from the bubble center. And you see it's bright here and it's dimmer there. You do see this kind of a diffuse emission. You see here the brightness as a function of energy. So it is bright between GeV and 100 GeV, which is not a small energy. Yeah. So you, you, you need to think, what the hell could that be that, that produced such, such things? Fermi bubble in different ways. You know, if you, if you take these energies, you do see this magic loop here with enhanced emission and so forth. So the better the instruments become, the more details you can see, and the better you, you can learn what is going on. And it is always, you, you have seen all these photographs of distant planets. Huh? The first photograph of Pluto or something like that was just a little white disk. Huh? Now probes fly by, and you see more and more details. And the, the latest figure of the picture of Pluto shows this white heart on it. Yeah? You, can only, you can only marvel, what is this? What, how is it possible that on a planet there is a white heart? Who painted that? Yeah? But you see it only if you have good 
instruments. And with the current generation, we can learn a lot. We see a lot of details. If we manage to improve by another factor of 100 or so, then God knows what we will find. Um, I told you that the Crab Nebula was uh, a standard candle. And people were looking at the Crab that they see it as well, and that they see it at about the same flux. Now, the Fermi guys were writing a program to compare the sky views they got every one and a half hours with each other to see whether then one was a star getting brighter or dimmer. You know, They made a variability analysis. And all of a sudden, they saw the crab was variable. Yeah? And as soon as they had discovered that, all of a sudden, in April 2011, crab was going through this phase here. This is mean Julian date. Okay, so from 55666 to 55668, this is two days. Yeah? So every blue point is basically a measurement, an average over measurements that have been taken with Fermi from the crab. And you see, this is kind of his normal level. And all of a sudden, whoops, whoops. It amplifies its output by, look, it's 100. So here we are 25 by a factor of 10. And then it's quietening down and it's getting, getting quiet again. So the normal crab level is like looking roughly like that. In the flaring state, it looked like that. Yeah. So what is going on? If you can measure spectra so well that you can say that you know the flux in one minute was here and half an hour later it was there and you see a variability in it, you learn more about the dynamics than you just get by staring at a crab for two weeks and then see, ah, there's a little bit of an enhancement. You see substructure, not only locally, but also in time. So let's look at that a little bit more in detail. This here is the crab, the flaring part again. And here is the spectrum. So for every blue point or for the period in, that stands for the blue point, we can see a spectrum. This is the flux logarithmically. And this is the energy. You know, Here is uh, one, one GeV. Here is 1,000 GeV, so one TeV. So you see there's a hump at about few hundred TeV. That's the first point. The next point, going up here a little bit, it's going up here. We see more flux at low energy, and here kind of nothing. Even more. This is almost a factor of 10 from down here to this. Even more. It's getting flatter. You know, now we see something outside here at TeV energies getting quieter again. It's shooting up. This is now, I believe, this guy here, the highest emission. No, this is the highest emission. And you see here really this shape nicely, yeah, which I showed before. The spectrum predicted by inverse Compton and by, by synchrotron radiation is nicely visible here. There's no kink. There is, you know, there is structure to it. And then it's getting dimmer again and it's vanishing back to its normal state. So there's a lot one can do. Oops. There's a lot one can do if one has good data. And I'm going through that again quickly. Yeah. With Fermi emission, one can observe gamma ray bursts, and one can do Lorentz invariance tests. One can see whether the photons of different energies come all at the same time, or maybe the high energy ones come later or come earlier, and you see an attempt here. So this is different energy ranges, 8 to 200 keV uh, to 5 MeV, uh, lat all events above 100 MeV, above 1 GeV. And you see there could be a time difference, a systematic time difference between them. So you can learn a lot if you see details. And uh, I'm stopping it here. I tell you in the next lecture about uh, some interesting results that have been achieved with the gamma ray telescopes and how we think to go on to build even better experiments. And the, the Fermi results you have heard and discussed already in other lectures.
So I stop it here and we have time for a few more questions. Thank you very much, Johannes. Why um, muon, muons uh, do rings in, in Cherenkov telescope cameras and protons and the other yes. things doesn't? Okay, so if one particle flies straight and produces Cherenkov light, you know, the Cherenkov light is emitted at a characteristic angle. Yeah? So around the axis always at a characteristic angle. Like that, if you were just looking what the Cherenkov distribution is down here, it would basically be, well, this curve I've shown you before, it looks like that, a kind of high, rather uniform area in the middle, but it would not be rings. But if you put now here an imaging element, like a telescope, a telescope focuses parallel rays to one point in the focal this in the focal plane so that means the image of Cherenkov light here uh, focused by this parabolic dish or spherical dish onto a camera would make a ring because all the guys going this side would go to one point and all going to that side would go to another point and anything else in between no? So it's really elementary optics. If you have a focusing element, a lens or a mirror, parallel beams here are focused in one point. And so if you have now a muon and part of this Cherenkov light is falling on that, then you get rings or, you know, as we have seen, a part of the ring or depending on the geometry then maybe a short segment of a ring. And if you have a short segment of a ring, you know, something like that, does look a little bit like a gamma ray. Yeah. Why does a muon make a ring and the others do not? Ah, and the second part of that is because the muon is relative massive compared to electrons, is uh, that it is not easily deflected. Remember, the deflection multiple scattering is worse for electrons because they are light, they are easily deflected. So if you have many particles, some go in this direction, some go in this direction, well, the sum of the Cherenkov light is a, is a big blob. But, but these rings, the characteristic rings in these are typically from muons that go for a long distance uh, without being much deflected. Yeah. Oh. The secondary photons that can be the detector are also gamma rays. Sorry, I didn't understand the question. The secondary photons that came in the detector of the Cherenkov. Yes. They are also gamma rays. They also have a lot. True. Of okay. Thank you very much for this question. So, what is the typical energy of a Cherenkov photon? It's a bluish light. So, the energy of a Cherenkov photon is of the order of three electron volts, yeah? It's a totally different type of light than the gamma rays that are produced in the shower. In the shower, we produce, we make pair production from gamma rays of 10 MeVs or more, you know? And the, these make Bremsstrahlung, and they are typically also MeV. So if you have a big array and you sample there the shower particles, yeah? They are of the order of 1 to 10 MeV. Yeah? So you were right. If we have here a telescope and the MeV particles would come down, you know, they would interact in the, in the air here and produce secondaries and all that. We would create a lot of Cherenkov light. But the TeV gamma rays we are looking at the showers are stopped in 5, 10 kilometers altitude. The shower happens between 25 and, and a few kilometers. 
and down at ground where the Cherenkov telescopes stand, you know, these showers particles don't make it down to there. At 10 to the 17, 10 to the 18 electron volt, you know, appreciable number of shower particles make it to ground, but, but not in TeV. They almost all, the showers are absorbed, the gamma rays are absorbed. It's just a bluish Cherenkov light that makes it down to ground. Uh, okay, this is maybe a silly question, because I don't understand how this Cherenkov telescope works. At some point you mentioned that they can cover a wide range because uh, you can catch a light from another cone. But if these telescopes work as conventional telescopes, they will concentrate the light in a primary uh, mirror, then to a secondary device, and where you call it light, or how do no, you... No, no, no. Uh, the simplest telescope you can have is just one lens. Yeah? For optical astro uh, astronomers, this is not good enough. And they have complicated systems of multiple mirrors and multiple lenses and things like that. Our Cherenkov telescopes are very simple. Yeah? We have one focusing element, the mirror, and we have a camera. Yeah? And so the light that falls on that is reflected on the camera. And parallel beams go on the same point. So if the light comes in like that, you know, it's reflected maybe to this end of the camera. Yeah? And the vertical is to this, and something coming from here comes to this. Yeah? So one lens or one mirror is enough to make an image. Yeah? So, and what we are imaging we are using the Cherenkov light, so we do not image the primary source. We do image the shower in the atmosphere. And then from that image, we reconstruct where it came from, what its energy is, and whether it's a photon or a, or a proton. OK, so my next question is, where should the uh, Cherenkov telescope should point? Good question. So. The first paper was a theorist paper, say, ah, oh, the crap is a good source. So they pointed at a crap. And then other people said, well, maybe, you know, active galaxies or maybe other violent places where you, in the optical, can see that there's a lot of energy dissipated. And that's they did, what, the first 15 years, you know. And they found some. There were lots of papers where people said, try this class of, of events. And sometimes they were good, and sometimes they were bad. Mm -hmm. And the blazars, the active galaxy that shoot a jet at us, were, were relatively good guess, you know? So all the blazars were, were investigated, and some were seen, and some were not seen. Yeah? And nowadays, we do have, we, you will, I will show that tomorrow, we do have about 200 sources which are established sources of TeV gamma rays of very different types. So in principle now, you're starting to say, well, we should see the full sky no matter what. By the way, the first measurements Hess was doing with their new telescopes then, they were performing a scan of the galactic disk. They were not pointing at individual sources. They were doing that as well, Crab and Markarian to see. Yeah? But then quickly they started to do a scan of the galactic disk, and they discovered sources there. They didn't know, they would not have looked from a theorist's prediction, say, look at this object. Yeah? They just made a scan, and the sources popped up. Yeah? But it's clear that, like with optical telescopes, Cherenkov telescopes do have a relatively small field of view. You have to point it. It's, it's, in the moment, it's impossible to make a full scan of the sky. Yeah? Can I ask a follow-up question, Jonas? Yeah. So basically, that's because with the Cherenkov telescope, eventually, whatever is the primary in the atmosphere, but the original incoming thing is a gamma, right? So it's a photon. So that's pointing straight to the target. And that's why you can basically point yes. at the target. Yes, yes. So we will come to that, you will see, with the current Cherenkov telescopes, you have about a tenth of a degree 
resolution in the sky. Now, if you take a random a tenth of a degree radius area in the sky, and you look what is known to optical astronomers to sit in this little patch of the sky, there are typically a dozen objects that possibly could sources, be sources of, of gamma rays. Yeah? So this is really poor resolution compared to the optical telescopes. But if you see now in this patch an especially violent one, and you see a lot of gamma rays from that direction, you say, aha, probably this guy produces the, 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 the thing. And with our next generation telescopes, we will go down there by a factor of 10, better resolution, and then it will be easier to identify. Yeah, just speak up. Okay. Regarding these uh, rings and the, the different shapes that different gamma or particles, whatever, making the Turing constant telescope, how good is the classification between different things? It's, it's good? So with the, uh, the modern telescopes, HESS, for instance, they typically have several images from one shower. Yeah? That helps. Yeah? So maybe from one side, a shower may look relatively slim and photon-like. But from the other side, then it's fuzzy, and then you know it was a proton. Yeah? Now, we are doing the analysis by comparing with simulations. And if you simulate, you calculate the cosmic ray background, and uh, you take an energy spectrum, and you calculate from perhaps 100 GeV to 100 TeV protons that come at various directions and so forth. And then you do simulate the telescopes, how the telescopes sample the light, how they make the signals in the camera, and then you simulate the reconstruction procedure, you know, the parametrization, the cuts, and all that. And then you have a set of cuts that says these are gamma ray candidates. Okay? Now, typically in such a simulation, there are 10 to the 9 proton showers. And less than 10 make, in the end, an image that looks like a gamma ray. Yeah? So almost all we simulate is rejected, is recognized as background. But the last few, how is it possible that a proton makes a shower that looks like a photon? Yeah? Uh, the first interaction could be a proton interacts here, and it makes a pi, and maybe something else, a little bit. And most of the energy is on the pi zero. Then this pi zero will decay right away into photons, and we have an electromagnetic shower. There's no way to distinguish such an event where the primary proton makes not much more than a pion that looks like electromagnetic. Yeah? So what I'm saying is we are rather good in rejecting things that look like protons. Yeah? It costs a lot of computing time to tweak your analysis and your rejection. Yeah? Uh, but in the end, we are fairly certain there are now a few strong sources where we can say there's almost no background, where we have 110 events and 100 are photons and only 10 are background. But for most sources, the weaker sources, it's, it's the other way around. It's 100 backgrounds and 110 in total. And then still we can say this was a source with some probability. So may I suggest that um, you have any, unless you have any more urgent questions, 
we keep it for tomorrow because there today there is no discussion session. There's going to be Carlos um, colloquium and then another seminar. Uh, maybe we'll start Carlos' class five minutes earlier, but then because the colloquium is at 2 p.m., so don't forget. I think Ernesto had something to say, right? You told me that it was. Later? Okay, good. Then uh, let's go for coffee break and then uh, we'll come in here. Thank you very much, Jonas.